Well, hello and welcome to um, another of the winter lecture talks that we've been having here at the Gothic Centre. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Kenilain. Uh, the way that this session will um, work is uh, we're going to have Sarika's talk first and then there'll be time for questions at the end. So Dr. Sarika Nilain is Senior Lecturer in Film Studies and American Studies and a founding member of the Manchester Centre for Gothic Studies here at Manchester Metropolitan University. She's the author of Postmodern Vampires, Film, Fiction and Popular Culture, published in 2019 by Paul Grave, and it was also winner of the 2020 Lord Riven Award. Um, and she has also published widely in the fields of Gothic and horror studies and popular culture, specializing in monsters, subjectivity, and cultural history. She's currently leading a project on the long 1980s on screen. Her paper today is drawn from this project and was, I believe, recently published um, in a special issue of the journal Gothic Studies that she also edited. Am I right in thinking that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, brilliant. So over to you, Sirika. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Sally. Cheers. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I can't see you at the moment because I'm literally looking at slides, but um, thank you so much for taking your time out of your evening to uh, to join us. And uh, I hope we can have a dip our toe into some nostalgia and some horror as we delve into the upside down. This, I should kind of tell you in advance, is a hybrid of a couple of different things that are going on in my life at the moment. One is that I am running this project called the Gothic 1980s Project. And so far it has had a couple of different outputs, one being the um, issue, July's issue, last year of gothic studies which was uh, dedicated to the gothic 1980s um the other was a issue of horror studies which came out last december again looking at 1980s horror culture and i also did a a conference, uh, sorry, not conference, a um, lecture series for home, uh, the cinema is cinemas in Manchester on um, going back to the 1980s. And that was more open in terms of its generic focus, but it was looking at that kind of return to the 80s that we're, we're experiencing. So tonight's talk is a partially to do informed by the material I've looked at before in Gothic studies, um, but also looking at um, the wider kind of thing of what's going on at the moment in the culture, wider kind of purchase. And it's a bit of fun. It's it's not designed to be dry in any way it's designed to be engaging and fun lots of pictures lots of images lots of um hopefully a bit of reminiscence and a bit of nostalgia for better or worse so i hope you enjoy um i hope this will cohere but you know i might possibly go off script because um i'm just going to get overstimulated and excited with all the material i'm looking at here so um this is the inside of my head most of the time so um okay let's get cracking so uh we're going back we're going back to the 1980s and popular culture in the 1980s um so the netflix series stranger things is one of a host of recent 1980s set texts so that, that has a return to the 1980s decade through the cultural lens of nostalgia. Um, recalling and resituating its viewers within the Reagan era, the series presents a contemporary Gothic narrative by returning to the 1980s as a period of profound cultural importance, setting its secondary Gothic space, the upside down, as a neoliberal shadow world that conveys profound implications for a terrifying future. Examining the 1980s as a nexus point for social political anxieties and nostalgic recall, which has dominated the economic landscape of many Hollywood films and shows in the 21st century, this talk today argues that Stranger Things situates its characters um, at the precipice of the wrong turn in history, a period in which the youthful band of our, our youthful band of heroes, like their upside 1980s, sorry, like their 1980s counterparts in science fiction and fantasy cinema before them, they all must chase down their own futures to prevent a terrible fate. Through reflective nostalgia, which I'll go into, this rift between the 1980s on screen and the shadow future of the upside down is presented as a diachronic narrative, a return to the past to identify and critique the 1980s as a point of origin for numerous socioeconomic anxieties and ills in our contemporary neoliberal Gothic world. Stranger Things, alongside other 1980s retro texts, articulates our own Gothic terrors in this contemporary moment. Moreover, the paper that I'm given today argues how and why the Gothic 1980s is a revisited site of return from which we need to learn, particularly following the post-2008 financial crisis, to overcome the necroeconomic consequences of the upside down and the neoliberal wasteland that is the 21st century. 
So what I'm going to talk about then, and this is something you're going to see lots of images in this um, presentation as well, is retro culture and 80s nostalgia. So how did we get here? Retro cycles and why has this trend emerged? It's emerged in several places. And then rethinking what we think of and what we know when we think of the 1980s. So the image you see um, to the left, as you know, you can see a videotape because we are feeling that sense of replay and recall. And of course, I couldn't help a poor little gizmo being frightened. But also we have on the right underneath, you have the New York Times. And this is an actual article from 2016 uh, called Don't You Forget About Me and the formerly irredeemable 1980s return. And this is one of the years in particular when this is really uh, cemented in the culture is 2016. So I'm, I'm very interested in 2016 is what happened as well there in terms of our, our return to the 80s. So the current mood, if you will, or indeed the last 12 months at the very least. So in many ways, we feel that the 1980s has truly been resurrected into a cluster of recent activity. And I say recent as in the last 12 months. Kate Bush, as you know, running up that hill from the Hounds of Love and Top Gun Maverick were number one uh, in their respective charts uh, last July. And the concluding episodes of season four of Stranger Things debuting little, uh, pretty much within a week or two of that same time, um, temporarily crashed Netflix's um, Netflix servers on the day of its release. So given the reception of these works thus far, it is also, I would imagine, unsurprising, and in the end it didn't turn out the way I'd hoped, but that there was a reprisal of Metallica's trash metal masterpiece, Master of Puppets, also at that time, given its prominence, of course, in the final episodes of the series. And of course, its profound evolutionary, and I would argue this to the death, uh, profound evolutionary importance in trash metal during the 1980s as well. We are caught then on this cycle of return, this retro return to a period in which um, we may feel, or at least we felt certainly back last summer, um, we may feel that exactly if we had gone through this the first time, if we had felt that, you know, 1986 had returned the first time, this strange return to the summer of 1986 came back again uh, last summer. So just to point out for you, this is the poster, the piggyback, which is for the, the series climax of season four of Stranger Things. We have Top Gun Maverick, which is situates the, the Top Gun story roughly 34 years after the, uh, after the original, because it was delayed with COVID. We have then on the far right, then we have, just in case you don't recognize any of these people, uh, that's Eddie Van Halen, um, and then, of course, below we have Iron Maiden's Legacy of the Beast, which was one of their very important albums from 1986. And as you know, uh, Iron Maiden's mascot is, of course, Eddie. And then we have um, the lovely Kate Bush from Hounds of Love. So this is just giving you this sense that there's always these echoes and these, this sense of space being, being played with. We're stuck in this time loop. The image of the clock you will know from Caesar Four of Stranger Things. And this is, of course, Vecna's clock, which I will come back to. But we have this sense of being caught in this loop. And this is something that is um, really just came to a kind of a very interesting point, I think, in, um, in, in the summer of last year. So in chronometric terms, most depressingly, I would argue, actually, um, the 80s began over 40 years ago, but its cultural recapitulation, undead economic legacies and pop cultural purchase continue to linger on in cyclical bursts and through revived materials. Returns and repetition, of course, underpin foundational aspects of the Gothic, whether it is through the form of nostalgic return to faded memories, jumbled up recollections or revisited sites of trauma and loss. Recalling and resituating its viewers in the dark visual echo of the Reagan era, the series presents its narrative as a period of profound cultural importance, setting its secondary space, the upside down, the as a shadow world that conveys profound implications for a terrifying future. Now, as a nexus point then for sociopolitical change that is overtly recalled under the presidency of Donald Trump, from 2017 to 2021, I argue that Stranger Things diegetically situates its characters at the precipice of this profound juncture um, or this wrong turn in history. This is really important because a lot of economic theory and a lot of cultural theory looks at the beginning of the 1980s as the beginning of this schism into something different, something strange, a new direction. And I think that 2016 really revisits that sentiment as well. So this schism is examined through postmodern simulacra and a remixing of signifiers of the decade. Like so many 1980s heroes in gothic inflected science fiction and fantasy cinema, the adolescents of stra in Stranger Things sense the instability of a promised future as a consequence for this disjunction in space-time. So these rifts are narrative replays that, uh, that concern anxious periods in time and have been witnessed before the 1980s as well. So looking at this then, 
During Reagan's presidency, for example, a, um, a staunch return to the past to overwrite the progress of the 1960s and 1970s was underway and expressed through the rhetoric of an idyllic 1950s that we know never existed in reality. And this is a form of restorative nostalgia against the country's socioeconomic realities and the uncomfortable advancements of people of colour, women, um, a shift in the family um, makeup, things like that. So Stranger Things deploys the same methodology through what Svetlana Boyam's uh, reflective nostalgia in returning to 1980s pop culture to articulate a severe warning about the riven necro world of the future on the horizon so that we, we should we collectively fail to intervene in its creeping and destructive economic encroachment. This is what awaits us in the future. So I'm looking at this to explore popular culture's ideas about why it continues to draw on the 1980s as a particular site of return, like why not another decade, and how the Upside Down is considered a, a very visual, brilliantly thought out um, uh, neoliberal space and inception um, in terms of its infecting economic system within Stranger Things. So one way to think about this is to think about technology. And one of the most important, I would argue, critics of the time, although he didn't realize it was its importance at the time, is um, the critic Tom Shales. He's a television critic and he was writing for Esquire in 1986 when he wrote this article. So it's a brilliant article called The Redecade. And what, I'll give you a very interesting idea about what, how it works and why it's important. So we've become comfortable with cultural time travel, described as the re-decade by um, tele television critic Tom Shales in Esquire in 1986. The 1980s was also driven by a compulsion to, and I quote, replay, recycle, recall, retrieve, reprocess and rerun earlier entertainments, anxieties and concerns. Shales continues on the nature of 1980s film and television entertainment that, quote, we are not amazed at the thought of time travel because we do it every day. With time in a constant state of shift, our lives increasingly vicarious, our contact with other human beings growing ever more remote, we're dislocated, disorientated, disengaged. We need new bearings for a new world. Now, looking back on Shales' article today, the sense of replay and disorientation feels thoroughly apt, articulating a similar concern that cultural progress is being stifled by our pronounced as, um, atomization. Shales continues that it could be argued that although the 80s are a retro decade, so it's already a, dec a retro decade in its own time, a kind of collective nostalgic breather, eventually an 80s style with emer will emerge, and then it could be argued right all right the way back that all decades from now on will be re-decades because we will be more and more armed with the instruments of replay and the technology will facilitate even more wizardly defiances of time. So these wizardly defiances of time then not only perpetuate a sense of feeling stuck, so replay culture makes us feel that we are completely uh, siloed and in curating our own reality, but also speak to the prevalence of time travel and nostalgic narratives that permeated throughout 1980s popular culture and continue to inform much of the reimagined return to that place through sequels, multiverse expansions that we witness now in contemporary culture. We never have to leave it. And that's something that Shales talks about that dislocation if you were out on a Friday night when Dynasty was on um, and you could just tape it and you could experience all the pleasures of watching Dynasty on Saturday morning. But this is also really interesting in terms of now with the prevalence of YouTube, with the prevalence of TikTok and all sorts of other media Media, we can literally curate our own today with anything we want and therefore stay within that sort of feeling of time. That time capsule is very important. Uh, so linearity and, and, and the feeling of shared experience, so cultural moments that we may remember from television and things like that, that is now increasingly lost to us because we are caught in time loops and silos. So this is something that I think is fascinating because it begins and really is incepted in the 80s and continues on. So this the sense of the 80s having a particular um, momentum in terms of being able to recall that nostalgia and at the same time um, never having to end is something that I think really uh, infects the kind of world of Stranger Things. So this is something I wanted to, to get you to think about. Um, moving on then, I'm going to show you one. And the reason why is I told you it was fun. You may or may not know this ad. It was a very, very important ad, particularly to me back in 1988. But it also shows that there is a, it ties together a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today. It's obviously not from Stranger Things. I hope you can hear it. It's not very long. 
Enjoy. Well, they seem to fit perfectly. Mm, they look nice. Mm, she looks like a proper little princess. 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 Princess, help us. But the I... witch of the forest has stolen the daylight. Yes. Climb up and release the sun from the witch's cave. But I can't climb Yes, you this. can. Just trust your magic shoes. Magic shoes? Clark's magic steps, shoes fit for a princess. Okay, so hopefully you are back in 1988 now, just as I was. I've never gotten over not being able to, not being allowed to have Clark's magic steps. However, um, what I love about this is that it brings together some really interesting ideas that come up time and again in 80s nostalgia and 80s television and film. So again, thinking about what Shales was talking about in terms of being frustrated as he was with the stale nature of 80s television, which was in so many ways looking at repeats and, and, and putting a lot of repeat. 60s television on at the time and how culture seemed to have been already caught up in a sense of cultural bricolage. What's interesting here is that this frustration can also be transplanted onto contemporary re-evaluations of 1980s texts. Stranger Things as a show actually brilliantly bypasses the actual television of the 1980s. It re merely retains just some small glimpses of broadcast programming while tapping into the 80s television anti-big government sentiment. That's a huge thing in 80s TV and that is something that Stranger Things does absolutely brilliantly. But what this does as well is it takes aesthetic cues and references from other 80s cinema instead. So this ad, the Clark's ad, as I said, I wanted to show you, it's one of the few gothic ads I remember being really pitched at kids. And what I thought was quite interesting about it was it foregrounds one of the big, big things that we see in 80s cinema. And this is something that Stranger Things comes back to, which it explicitly restages childhood agency, which we get at the foreground of the cinema Steven Spielberg, for example, while delighting in the gothic objection of, in the case of that, it's just a little girl, it's a little girl who's freeing the, the, the little boys, which looks a bit like legend if you know the film the Tim, the Tom Cruise film from the mid 80s but what I think is interesting here is that it influences and draws on all the other kind of ideas around the gothic at the same time you have children who are put in peril there are adults whom you distrust there's a quest of some kind and you know to sell shoes it really was effective so effective it ran for four and a half years but you see this in other cinema then for a much larger audience in the case of John Carpenter's remake of The Thing from 1982 and the searing critique of Reaganism that he presents also in They Live. So we see this idea of critiquing culture and somebody fighting back from outside the system. Usually you have this in the form of children, but obviously there are other films that bring this forward in adulthood, particularly in the case of John Carpenter. But all of this is to address the horrors of actual policies and economic consequences of the 1980s that have destroyed the potential future of 80s adolescents as adults in the 21st century. So how does this all feel very gothic then? Well, <laughs> there's loads of gothic to talk about in terms of kids and generations. The contemporary gothic, as Stephen Broom argues, is suffused with um, traumatic returns marked out in narratives by the protagonists and the viewers' compulsive return to certain fixations, obsessions and blockages. The observation chimes well with the processing of 80s nostalgia. It's dressed up in a lacquered veneer of, ne of neon and mourning the period of intense consumerism dri driven by Reaganite mantras to pursue prosperity. The period usually also appears to be frivolous, even empty sometimes to its critics, but it does not fully address the purchase of its undead continuance today. The critic David Sirota notes that 80s nostalgia in the popular 21st century entertainment has become more prominent because this nostalgia really may not be a resurrection at all. Our 80s fetish may actually be an intensification of an ethos that never actually went extinct, in part because no epochal force ever intervened to kill it. 
So indeed, the Gothic stranglehold feels distinctly evident in contemporary political divisions raging on in contemporary culture wars, such as over education, LGBTQI inclusivity, the terror of the oncoming digital future and metaverses, and we arguably already are living in that point, and the ferocity of toxic patriarchy in figures such as Trump, who gleefully represses minorities and wrench um, whole, con whole communities asunder. So what we see here when we look at some of these texts, and I hope you recognize some of these films, I mean, Return to Oz was a sequel. It was a sequel to The Wizard of Oz. It was also one that traumatized a lot of kids. If you remember The Wheelers, for instance, it's a very gothic text. I've written about this elsewhere. It's an incredibly gothic text. And again, it's gothicizing the child. The child is... Um, working within the kind of fantasy rules and the adults are the ones to be distrusted. Uh, again, Masters of the Universe based on a game obviously became a, a cartoon and then again using a lot of gothic imagery and then became a canon film in 1987 with Dolph Lundgren as He-Man and Frank Langella, the awesome Frank Langella as Skeletor. We also have Willow which has recently been made into a television series. Um, Willow is again an 80s gothic quest, terrifying, horrible adults, uh, and um, a child to be protected in the case of Princess Eleonora. Um, and then we have Legend, which if you don't know Legend, it's, it's really worth going back to. It's Ridley Scott's project after um, Blade Runner. It's uh, again, full of magical imagery. And again, looks at a lot of the kind of gothic idea of prophecy, saving the last unicorn, things like that. And Tim Curry as the devil, it's well worth watching. But these texts would have been texts that also have been in, suffused with certain memories and trauma. You have a lot of people who talk about encountering these texts and having particularly frightening images in them surrounding children in particular. Um, and this is something that the critics that I'm looking to to talk about generations, uh, Strauss and Howe, they point to a significant shift between films of the 1970s, whether they're gothic or otherwise, and how they posit children versus how this gets shifted entirely pretty much from about 1982 onwards, um, where the protagonists are shifted and are considerably younger when we look at 1980s cinema. Um, so in the 70s, it is still largely driven by adults and adult issues. There are some children's films and programming for sure, but it's not center stage in Hollywood. But then by the 1980s, it absolutely takes effect and has stayed you know, quite young since then. There's another few examples to show you. So, for instance, we have in this return, then we have a return to youth culture and youth nostalgia of the decade, which can be seen. And even in the background image I have here, I've got Ted Logan, of course, from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I have Maverick, of course, from Top Gun. And I have Eleven in the middle to show you that there is this sense of repetition and return. Um, we also have here this idea that the future has been reclaimed or has, they're trying to reclaim a promised future that has failed. You'll also know if you're quick on this one that all three of those have basically um, occurred in, as either sequels or as long form series in the last two years. So you have Bill and Ted uh, face the music and you obviously have Top Gun Maverick as well. So these are returns that are happening to kind of reclaim or something went wrong or something was left unfinished in the 1980s. Unfortunately, that also ripples out into reality as well in terms of kids who were born in the late 1980s in the West in particular are probably going to be the first generation who have less stability and economic security than their parents. Kids born in the 1990s and 2000s are actually less likely than ever to recover the lost ground, the lost economic ground brought about by precarity and under neoliberalism. So Strauss and Howe read Generations, and they have many books on this, um, Generations being the most famous one, but there's also The Fourth Turn, which is uh, really worth reading if you want to think about how generations have different identities. Um, but they talk about um, generations having a particular drive and an ideological position, and each one of them has this sort of accumulation of feeling or sense of sentiment about their own mass identity uh, as being children of that period. And they talk about this being renewed every 20 or so years and the current generation of what would be termed as millennials, people who turn to came of age by the millennium. So you tend to think of millennials as born around 1980 two onwards. Um, these are the hero generation. They're the ones who are going to be put through the test of the metal of, of, uh, of huge crises. And when it's solved, they will, this will be the thing that defines their generation. The previous hero generation were uh, GI veterans in World War II. So you see that there's a certain parallelism here and it is it is fluid. It's not necessarily a, a rough science, uh, sorry, a, an exact science, but you do see that narratives in cinema follow this trajectory nicely as well. Kids 1970s I spoke about were not as relevant or not seen as an economic focus. So they're sometimes even seen as a source of anxiety. You see a lot of kids as things to be fought over in the case of Kramer versus Kramer. 
kids that are possessed in the case of the exorcist or kids who are going to be the you know the, the second coming of the devil in the case of the omen but we see that there's so there's an unknowable terrifying future for children in the 70s by the 80s though those kids now have individual drive, narrative importance, economic power, and always kind of demonstrate leadership over their parents in 80s popular culture. So there's an, a very definite shift there in the popular media. And I really wanted to bring that out. Um, and that again, this um, it's a piece I have, in, this is actually from Forbes, which says millennials are doomed to face an existential crisis that will define the rest of their lives. So this is falling into that Strauss and Howe idea of uh, what's going to happen to us all, or if you are of that generation. Um, and of course, just to say there are micro generations as well. It's not that you are only part of one generation. There are micro generations and generations that bleed across. Uh, I, for example, are from, from the Xenial generation. I am um, born between all three original Star Wars films. Uh, so identifying all this then is important because we need to think about how this impacts in the greater, in the greater argument of, of Stranger Things. One impact that it, this does is when you start to see children in the 80s in cinema, you see them pretty much everywhere. And that's because it was a boom period. So one thing that you do see is kids going on amazing, gothic, strange quests. One of them is, of course, um, you see things like, of course, the Goonies. It's a pirate ship adventure. But you also see like, you know, um, uh, a child being left behind and having to fight off the aliens and alien. In the case of uh, Carrie Hen, you have little Danny Lloyd trying to navigate the corridors of the, of the uh, Overlook Hotel heather o'rourke as of course the conduit for poltergeist which i'm positive matt talked about in his talk a few weeks back and then you have whole casts of children who are taking on the authority of adults like you have with the monster squad again the goonies end up saving their parents from being um you know um rendered homeless um or indeed adventures in babysitting so we have a lot of children's focused narratives even the golden child a film that i'm very interested in it is a mess of a film, but it is a fascinating mess of a film because it looks at so many intersections of identity and looking at the idea of a of a, of a forsaken or a, um, a a child whose prophecy and whose life is, is going to mean prosperity or, or doom for everybody. And it brings in all those big signifiers about the 80s and the world ending, the apocalyptic feeling you expect from these films. But there's loads of them. Once you start to see them and lift that rock, you'll see them everywhere. And that's because there is this push towards youth culture and the youth being the ones who are who have to take charge of the situation because parents tend to become a bit of a mess in 1980s cinema um more widely when you're looking at 80s culture and 80s horror films you tend to see that it goes progressively younger we do have the slasher cycle which obviously courts the younger viewer uh, courts the teenage viewer and it's the teens and i say when i say kids i do mean everything from small children up to sort of burgeoning adulthood 17 18 we do tend to see that these are these are the target audience but they're also the people who are charged with having to save the world time and again, whether it's from vampires, ghosts, monsters, or indeed invasions um, of some kind. Uh, so we see this through the slasher cycle, obviously vampires, we don't tend to get older vampires in the 80s, they tend to go a lot younger. Um, there's always there's always going to be outliers, but in the majority, it tends to be kind of skewed towards teens. We have werewolf cycles, we have aliens, we have body horror. And in body horror, I think you, you're more likely to think of it as more adult, quite literally, than, than some of the younger kids. We don't tend to see that with younger kids as much, but there's always, as I say, a few examples. All of this is to say that we get this skew towards youth. And we get this skew towards a kid who can see through it. The great example of this, of course, is Beetlejuice, where, you know, we have Lydia who can literally see between the two worlds, between the world of her parents, which to which she does not feel that she belongs as a gothic child. And then the fact that she can actually see Adam and Barbara up in the attic. Um, so these are all spaces that negotiate that tweenness of growing up that children beautifully kind of occupy both worlds. Right. So to think about this and how it works in terms of recollection and historical recall um, the conjunction it, there's a hugely interesting way of thinking about this in terms of the gothic and this sense of periods of time clashing together so as Stephen Shapiro notes um, he says a gothic's troubled historical recollection and precognitive prolipsis occurs because the conjunction of a contracting economic long wave and a newly expansive one simultaneously enables a synoptic retrospection of a past cycle's arc, while also foreshadowing the resurrection of its dynamics. In the grip of this sort of change, then what we find is that as we feel we're approaching the end of one cycle, we go back and replay the earlier cycles, anxieties and concerns. We feel this sense of shift and change. However, 
with the 1980s, then we get something a little bit different. This is all in the grip of an anxious, cultural and traumatic present that we are experiencing. And it's brought about through tentacular, networked, contaminating and eroding social cohesion under the yoke of neoliberalism. So the market's ghostly hand, this invisible ghostly hand informs a version of the future that looks uncertain and gloomy, if not doomed by automation and economic degradation. So nostalgia inflected programming then provides a strategy to consolidate and or critique myths about the past prior to the moment of the wrong turn in history. And in Stranger Things, this feature returns as a drive to drive the audience towards a socially shared future, a promising future that reassures and reorientates viewers and urges them to seek out these goals and count to counteract the distracting horrors of the, of the precarious present. So what I'm looking at here on this slide um, you have Shapiro's excellent observation about, you know, the kind of the clashing of arcs and this moment whereby we find that there's a previous style being played out while we're kind of looking at the looking down at um, the face of potentially a new a new system or, or an even an acceleration of that system. Um, but Stephen Prince, also a brilliant academic who's written fantastic work on the 80s before, he writes about that sense of replay and extension ad nauseum that, come, that comes out of the industry in the 1980s. So we have um, sequelization, for example, and uh, I won't read out the whole thing, but it basically the, the whole industry was taken over by mathematicians. And the imperative to sequelize a successful picture became also powerful in the period that the studio sought to brand audience loyalty by developing characters and film properties that could be manufactured in perpetuity. As a result, the endings of many films were not really endings, just postponements of narrative until the next installments. And that we begin to see as something that we are now living in this metaverse thing where you can just expand it forever and ever. Um, but this sense of continuation was very important in the, in the 80s. And that is something that the industry has now become completely reliant upon for any kind of IP. So, um, so now you don't pitch a film, you try and pitch a trilogy if you're going to, uh, going to find yourself in that position. So this is fascinating to me because it's all about also recalling nostalgia. I've signaled to you before that there's films that have been remade or sequelized 20, 30 years after the 80s ended. So this is this is very interesting to me because it's calling back in those particular audiences, those branded audiences and those who who never really left the 80s behind for good or bad. So nostalgia itself, though, has completely accelerated across the 20th century. And Jacobson observes that it is felt and expressed on screen, perhaps now more so than ever. Nostalgia, it seems, he says, pops up in history and spreads whenever the world, the nation or the community experiences a sense of crisis and unrest. And when uh, forces start to talk about the good old days before everything went wrong. However, these nostalgic turns are not always presented as unambiguous desires for an uncomplicated return to an earlier time or place. 1980s nostalgia programming does not universally present a sanitized version of the past in the form of restorative nostalgia, which can only poison with its false promise of a restoration of a time that never actually happened. Rather, the retro 80s texts that I'm interested in looking at function as reflective nostalgia texts, which Boyem terms uh, in her own creation, she does separate the two very distinctly. Such texts, she says, are about taking time out of time and grasping the fleeing present, where recall and critical thinking are not mutually exclusive and where irony, play and present day concerns are reflected. For Boyem, she says, both restorative nostalgia and reflective nostalgia can use the same triggers of memory and symbols, the same Proustian Madeleine cookie, but tell different stories about it. So while these retro texts and these retro returns and Stranger Things is the big one I'm thinking of here, seem to initially sell, if not overwhelm the viewer with the return to the 1980s as an escape, escapist fantasy from our neoliberal present, they do not omit its horrors. Rather, both Stranger Things and another text that really does this quite well, which is Ready Player One, front load their diegetic return to and citation of the 1980s to critique neoliberalism's real political consequences beyond the surface of the lost artefact or product. The visual gloss, rather than simply function as a superficial distraction, littered with CGI and SF SFX and nostalgic recall, provides a fleeting sweetness to ensure that the bitter truth is fully absorbed. So this bitter truth is something that we need to think about. And this, this is it, essentially. What is awaiting the kids of the 70s and 80s who grew up to become adults today? Well, 
crippling debt for one. Um, this is a screenshot from um, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. And uh, Kenneth Muir brilliantly observes that this is the moment when we have this declaration of this kind of Reaganite, nightmarish Reaganite declaration, where the signature moment of the era where Freddie shows up at a pool party and tells the, the Reaganite kids and teenagers, you are all my children now. They are the ones who are going to be enslaved to debt. They are the ones who are going to never be able to own their own home. Or if they are, they just about get away with it. They're the ones who will be, you know, completely crippled with credit card debt as well. So this is all this anxiety that we see them building up and throughout the end, throughout the 80s and into the into the 90s, then becomes the form of yuppie, uh, yuppie horror as well. All of this is to say that the economic concerns that we find in films like Nightmare on Elm Street really do are attuned so perfectly to what was going on in that time period. And as I say, because it concerns teenagers, it is still about thinking about that young generation, how they are completely subserved, um, subsumed by market forces. So. The rise of market precarity, then boom bust property cycles and fiscal disaster of 2008 proved that future security could easily be swept aside. In response, Hollywood has been rebooting it the 80s past for at least 15 years in popular cinema and television. By 2010, film and television critics were quick to predict that the year of the 1980s remake was the year of 2010. And it featured um, rebooted sequels and films such as Nightmare on Elm Street, as you know, The Karate Kid and The A-Team. Kathleen Luke observes in her study of the 80s cycle in Hollywood that the trend continued at pace throughout the 2010s, which it did. And during which time, when she published her article in 2016, she said up to 30 films and television shows from the 80s will be remade in the 2010s. A number of which, um, a, a number that Variety's Mark Grazer described um, of the long past decade as a dynamo for contemporary remakes. So the trend of reviving 80s entertainment properties has become an economic expression of what Simon Reynolds also calls retromania. The trends are driven by commercial imperatives and rely on pre-tested material that they repeat, modify and continue in order to ensure box office success. However, pre-2016 1980s materials were largely resuscitating a version of the IP from the 1980s product and lent more towards a revival rather than an overt diachronic critique on the period that emerges more fluently post-2016. So there is a very, I think, a huge difference between pre-2016 80s retro texts and post-2016 retro texts. As the year of 1980s hauntological returns in popular culture, 2016 marks the shift whereby we can see a replaying of similar post-recession anxieties, the re-emergence of yuppies, now as influencers, and presidents, and texts that actively re-enter the diegetic 1980s to speak about our awful undying present. So these are some of the texts that came out in 2016. Um, these are some of the articles that you might see. So we're thinking of this time at a joint. Uh, you have the San Junipero, of course, episode from Black Mirror. We also had, um, I thought what was so interesting about 112263 was that while it is concerned with the 60s, again, the fact to return to this particular idea of how I could change the past, this disjunction in time in King's novel. Again, it got greenlit and got made at that time. There was also discussion talking about actually doing a sequel to E.T. that actually is only from last year. But again, the thought of trying to resequalize um, that that film is, is something that's quite interesting. Um, and again, why are we still obsessed with the 1980s in 2016? It's an article from Vulture. I showed you an earlier one from New York Times and also from Forbes. So this idea of it was in the water in, 19, in, in 2016 and this concept of is it for re restorative nostalgia or is it indeed for reflective nostalgia? This is where the texts kind of tend to separate themselves. So you could think of this as the 1980s 2.0. So this 2016 issue of why everything changed again in 2016 is it was it was the zenith of this period of return. It also acknowledges the distinctive mood and shift change and tone of these films. And taking stock in this cultural shift is quite important. It branches off into restorative nostalgia. So MAGA, for example, um, uh, the idea of, you know, get, making America great again, Brexit, the idea of returning to a, whether you read it that way or not, it is something to do with co recalling past glories of empire, um, you know, standing alone, that kind of thing. Um, and those campaigns called out for restoration of past glories, values and privileges. And um, remakes and stylizations of past films are often rebounded or repackaged as reboots at this time. 
But Stranger Things, San Junipero and other films in the series around 80s culture, so Ready Player One or indeed Cobra Kai, if you've been watching that, non-franchise properties tend to look at it a little differently. They tend to look back and look at the fault elements of the 1980s resurfacing in the indexicality of the culture. So it's looking at, yeah, it's nostalgic and beautiful and put together in a, in a very um, aesthetically pleasing way. And it does give you that hit, that dopamine hit of nostalgia. But at the same time, it is also about, God, maybe it wasn't so great. Maybe things actually, that was the beginning of where things went wrong and why I don't feel so, so, so positive about the future that I was once promised. So you do have this where the empty, the empty restorative nostalgia is about sort of giving you back what you what you feel you've lost. Whereas with the with the with the reflective one, it is about giving you that hit, but also thinking about the future is 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 screwed if we don't act or if we don't bring bring everything together. So as Julia Wright talks about, oh excuse me, I'm sorry, I missed something here. Um, so Dustin, as we know from Stranger Things, Dustin describes this parallel world of the upside down, likening it to the Veil of Shadows, a fictional construct from the group's Dungeons and Dragons games. The upside down is, and I quote, a dimension that is a dark reflection or echo of our world. It is a place of decay and death, a plane out of phase, a place of monsters. It's right next to you and you don't even see it. Dustin's description emphasizes the shadow plane of the invisible hand of the neoliberal market. This is further explicated by their science teacher, Mr. Clark, who similarly um, defines the parallel dark world as an echo of the material plane where necrotic and shadow magic exists. Now, this magic, this gothic world is ruled over by the monster of deregulated finance, of course, a form of shadow magic that remains completely hidden from view and that hollows out and exploits the body politic in service for corporate and private interests. As Julia Wright observed on the similar on the similar modes of anxiety, surveillance and infiltration that we find in Gothic television series more broadly, she says that Gothic nightmare of the US libertarian fantasy of regulation with regularity without regulation is exemplified by the figure of the invisible hand of Adam Smith's wealth of nations. So the upside down is a biological and abject expression of growing and unseen infiltration of neoliberalism's full effects, which literally expands and hollows out the promise of the American dream into an empty consumerist fantasy of economic prosperity without end for the fortunate few. For American Midwestern towns, then, such as Hawkins, the oncoming effect of economic blight is literalized as it plummets such communities into severe decline. Once unleashed, then, the spread of the free market capitalism is both ubiquitous and profound. When the neoliberal, uh, sorry, when the upside down flashes into view, the extent of its infiltration is actually incredibly frightening. I'll just show you an image here I have for you. There we go. We can see how frightening it is, how totalizing it is. Um, it, it's it, the extent of its infiltration is frightening by virtue of its totality. Glimpses of its invasive te te tentacular rotting vines spread through the town of Hawkins, from the walls of the school to the local arcade and into the homes of its residents, particularly the home of Will Byers, as we see in, in top image, the young boy whose disappearance and rescue informs the first season of the series. Now, I have a theory about how this all hangs together as well. Um, so let me just go back for a second. Thinking about the upside down and thinking about the imagery that you see here, one that I think is quite fascinating is this idea of the mind flayer who stands over the image of Hawkins. And it was brilliantly put, put in an article by Megan Garver that the Hawkins mega monster is vaguely arachnid in shape, vaguely viral in function, and by turns apparently both electric and gaseous. The show's kids nickname it the Mind Flayer, and it's appropriate. This is the monster of the mind. It hijacks the system, a body, a town, a world, right through the nerves. It lives among the people, below the ground, below the people, in a parallel, parallel world of the upside down. But in and in its formlessness, its monsters, mirrors, lurks, anxieties about terrorism and climate change, about Facebook and hacking, and I would argue about metaverse as well, about systems that are too powerful and not powerful enough. The invincible, the invincible, all threats we cannot see and therefore cannot directly fight. No amount of human bravery or ingenuity or well-aimed slingshot, no powerful gun, no bold act of collaboration can destroy it. The mind flayer is helplessness made monstrous. So with that in mind, and in particularly thinking about that in terms of season two, when we first see the mind flayer, we get this sense of having to act up against this big bad that is in many ways completely pervasive from the offset. 
And this is where we start to see these kind of texts coming back again, thinking about how the damage is already done, this sense of parallel, this sense of children in peril are being taken away, this idea of a parallel universe or a parallel world beneath our own, the sense of the fate of the universe hangs in our in the balance, whether that's Bill and Ted or indeed even in the um, in the concluding elements of Stranger Things, or this idea, even going back to something like Back to the Future, where you always get this sense of there is another timeline that could have ripple effects. So we're we're really interested in this kind of what could have been and the nostalgia is always trying to grapple with those bigger ideas. So then thinking about the upside down, then who are the targets of the upside down usually in this series? Well, we I mean, there's a few, but one that you come across time and again is in living in the upside down, whether we feel this way now, and certainly we see this with the characters, it tends to be characters who are under the cut of economic precarity so whether it's zero hours contract or low pay there's a lack of security and stability whether it's jobs pensions houses rights neoliberal ideology the idea of accumulation and more and you see this between the parents of the kids in the show you see the political alignment basically exp explicitly in the second series but you also see it in terms of the home and the kind of the mantras that they spur on so you know, for example, that Mike's parents are most certainly Republican, for instance. Um, Dustin's mother is, uh, she's the only person voting for Mondale, for example, in 1984. So she is more middle of the ground. And then we get this sense of disenfranchisement with the, the poor who don't talk about their politics. Um, the inequality and the targeting of the poor and the vulnerable, or indeed the marginalised, is something that comes out in the show as well. Now, I'm not saying the upside down is targeting them um, because of that. I'm saying that it's neoliberalism is targeting characters like that because again, this is something that is uh, what it does. It, 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 it picks off those that it feels is the most vulnerable and who cannot fight back. So value is equated then to power and influence and financial status. It's brought about under uh, um, uh, unethical or immoral conditions. And of course it always serves the 1%. And it is terrifying because it's everywhere. It's sheer invisibility is horrifying. And this is something that Kerry Dodge talks about a lot in Stranger Things as well. So then what's going to happen here then? Well, thinking about this nostalgia, it's reframing it. The show is reframing it in such a way where we get to reimagine a return in order to make the right choice, in order to move things into the right direction. We now have this sense of going back to that hero kid that you remember in those films uh, from the 1980s the first time around. It's about trying to reach in and find that person within yourself and then for you to make the right decision or indeed this is how I read those texts as operating the consequences of those decisions we've already seen were in the wrong timeline now we have to through that kind of sense of gothic time we need to kind of reclaim that and try and move it back towards something more sustainable something that works better um what I was going to talk to you about then just briefly was season four so in the article I published in Stranger Things, I'm sorry, in Gothic Studies on Stranger Things, one of the things I was talking about at the time, because the article had finished before season four had come out, one of the things I was very interested in was it's, it's, it's imagery and spiders and arachnids and monsters. And this is something that comes hugely to the fore in season four. I have a couple of theories about season four, which I'm writing about at the moment. And one of them is about this idea of spiders and um, hegemony and economic empires. So this is something that you can definitely draw in a comparison between between Vecna and Trump. You can draw this idea around um, influence and power. And again, with Vecna being a particular product of a kind of, uh, a product of the 80s in some respects, you also see this with Eleven as well. And this is something that they have a parallel narrative at work that I think comes out quite nicely in the show. The imagery around, recurring imagery around spiders and vines, um, spider webs, things like that. That again shows that again, the idea of accumulation and hegemony, the idea of bringing everything in and literally abjectly consuming it and, and throwing it out as detritus. This is something that we see throughout the entire Upside Down. So in a way, inserting Vecna's narrative into the Upside Down origin is interesting because one of the things we discovered in the fourth season was that there was a time lapse when Nancy went to get her gun, if you remember that sequence, there is a time lapse back to a point where we actually, it's the day that Will disappears in the first season. So we're now getting a time shift coming through in the fourth season as well, which I think is even more um, uh, explicit in its articulation of this as a di as completely diachronic narrative. Um, the other thing I was interested in as well was this idea around clocks and chimes, something I'm quite obsessed with anyway. And one of the things that I noticed with this was that 
under Vecna, things change as well. We have the inescapable neoliberal absorption. We have the interlinking idea of hegemony, supply chains, the vines, power and poisons, economic silos, trapping people into uh, insecure jobs, insecure financial situations. But we also notice as well that there's something very interesting about um, uh, Im recurring images around clocks. And this was something, clocks being broken, time being frozen, quite literally. But we also get the chime of the clock. And I thought that was quite interesting as well. There's these four chimes of the clock that we get in the fourth season. And this controls, and it's talking about reversing time. We see the hands wind back. We also get four chimes for the four victims, but it's also four decades since the 1980s and the four sites of the cracks into the upside down that emerge in the end. Could, you could argue, also look at the economic, the political, the emotional identity, and indeed the textual expression of the 1980s recurring again and again. So this is something that we, it feels a sense of produced, a warped feeling that we have of living in the 80s 2.0. And this is this is where I'm finding that you know, the footing of all of this is. So you have to think about, well, where can we go from here? Well, one thing that has to be done is, and this is something that the show, I think in its liberal left imagery and ideas really ex um, expands upon as I'm coming to a conclusion here. So it needs to, it, it, the show is asking us to hold political and cultural forces accountable. If you think about people in authority in the show, they usually are shown to be corrupt in some respect, with the exception of the um, adults who have to go off and have their own um, particular um, storyline in the film, in the show. What you do find is that political people in power, Mayor Klein, people like that, they are all corrupt in their own way. So this shows you that, you know, those in charge of kind of 80s mantras are usually not to be trusted. Um, we also need to query the source of rage. So much around the show is around this idea of rage and being actually cast out in culture. And this is always about querying the source of that rage and querying the immediacy of it. The restorative solutions that we have around 80 cinema and its cozy language, we need to be very wary of that because usually that leads back to the kind of idea of restorative nostalgia. Obviously, the show is constantly asking us to be aware of the demonization of others or to seek simple answers, whether it's Eddie, in the case of Eddie literally being a target, standing in for the satanic panic period of the 1980s in the case of the show, and actually becoming probably one of its most beloved characters, um, and indeed scapegoating people who are different. We always see this with Eleven. Um, and again, being aware of those reactionary ideas, this is what the show is trying to get its youthful audience, because I think it's always speaking to two audiences. It's speaking to adults, it's speaking to people who are remember the 80s and then it's speaking to younger kids and that's it and in doing so it's telling them the time before was not so great it might have looked interesting but it wasn't so great the time after is your time to reclaim it think of it like the goonies it's our time our time up here and then at the end is a salutary lesson for all of us to think about the 80s or any kind of siloed period of time that we can curate. It's not a permanent destination. It's always a false sense of a permanent destination. We have to think about it in terms of community and, and, and thinking about less about me. So greed is not good, but also rather that it's more about community and actually building a, a future together. So this is how we reclaim the future then. What we're gonna do, we have to think about this idea that lots of science fiction and fantasy with goth use the Gothic essentially to lay bare the necessity to turn our gaze towards the present once more so that the dreadful future depicted of course might be avoided at the same time shows like stranger things for example warns us against pure utopianism which inevitably hides the seeds of dystopia within itself in favor of a more realistic version of the future which having lost its gloss now seems darker than ever um to quote doc brown the future is only what we make it thank you very much I'm going to stop sharing because I can't see anything.